Hello, my name is Dr. Katie Abbott. I'm Senior Lecturer in Composition at Melbourne Conservatorium of Music, University of Melbourne. I am a composer, educator, and in more recent years find myself doing more artist mentoring. I completed my Bachelor of Education back in 1994 and I've been teaching ever since in schools, universities and industry. In 2020, I created Dinner for Breakfast, where I support the artist behind the art making. I partner with musicians and artistic creatives to build careers that are vibrant, joyful and have impact, but more importantly, through aligning the artist with their art to create careers that are sustainable and meaningful on their own terms in the industry. And I do this through online programs, and mentoring containers such as the Holistic Artist Thrive and the Holistic Artist Catapult. I began composing with very little music background at the age of 27, 28, and over the last 20 plus years have always simultaneously been teaching and composing. In all my roles, it's curious to me that I find myself often working with introverts and highly sensitive people, of which I am squarely both, and today I'd like to zoom in on instrumental and classroom music settings with this cohort in mind. I consider myself a bit of a magpie. I pick up bits and pieces and create order and usefulness from seemingly random things. And I used to judge myself harshly for this trait, but I've learned there is an innate sense to my quirky ways and you will find a hodgepodge of ideas that I trust will make sense as I pull it together over our time here. In my work as a composer, I often build into my compositions space for musical or conceptual ideas to land for the listener. I call them oral palate cleansers. For example, in my one hour cycle of songs for six voices and six instruments, the text for this work came from surveying women from around the world for their hidden thoughts, asking them what they've learned to be brave about and what they'd like to be braver about. It was both humorous and really heavy. At the very opening of the work, there's a percussion solo, one player on two hi-hats with added cratal. It's a virtuosic two minute crazy venture and my intention for this seemingly, seemingly incongruent miniature was to allow the audience the chance to bridge the space between their day and preparing themselves for what they were about to hear kind of like a top restaurant might offer when they present mouthfuls between courses to cleanse the palate before the next offering. I believe this creates capacity and intention for the listener. And this paper is as much as about musical tools as it is about building capacity for both teacher and students. I've always been fascinated by the human aspects of the creative process, and I'm quite committed to addressing the who behind the art making and looking at music making alongside acknowledging the human making the music. Bringing the artist back into the picture. Charlie Parker, brass player, once famously said, music is your own experience, your thoughts, your wisdom. If you don't live with it, it won't come out of your horn. And what he meant was that anyone can blow a trumpet. But when someone steps up to play the trumpet, they're bringing with them the hours of practice, the personal growth, the musical development. But they're also, but they're also bringing with them a body, one that might not have had enough sleep or have had something to eat that makes them feel bloated before they play, a body that's excited or nervous. It's not the trumpet, of course, that makes the art. It's our experience outside the music making that also inherently impacts the music. And this is a universal experience, of course, not just related to the art of music. Schools and universities are often pouring resources and information into our students from the outside in. And I like to talk a little more about working with students from the inside out. For the cohort of students who sit on the introvert side of the introversion scale, working with them in this way can help them to build capacity, both personal and artistic, 
and also gives them the opportunity to demonstrate to the teacher and to themselves what they're really capable of thinking and producing. You might recognise yourself as one of those people who has stairwell thoughts. That is, you're walking away from a situation, perhaps down a stairwell, and then you conjure up the best answer or the thing, the thing that you wish that you'd said or realised what you'd wanted to express. Now, I know that you are no stranger to the creative process and everyone has a different relationship with the creative process. I see the creative process as circular rather than linear. To me, the creative process is a cycle. Did anyone's heart sink when they saw one of these aspects on the cycle? Maybe presentation or the metaphorical whole getting started. Everyone struggles with different aspects of the creative cycle. Maybe you could note the aspects that made you worry or perhaps made you feel a bit excited. It's really important that we fully finish the creative cycle because the cycle starts to reinforce itself and it becomes a beautifully positive reinforcing tool. It must have most of the elements there and I know that one aspect that people think is optional is public showing. Some of these emotions will be familiar to you, but maybe they occur in different spots. What's your relationship like with the creative process? Where do you feel familiar and confident? Are there areas that you avoid? We bump into ourselves doing this circular process. And it is often the things we bump into that are the sticking points in our creative process. Fear, doubt, time, restlessness, anxiety. Sometimes it brings up our personal and past issues. And this is hard when we want to create and simultaneously need to deal with the big feelings. And that can send us sideways or into procrastination. When we engage our students in the creative process, they will inevitably bump into themselves. Some process and move on, others get stuck, others skip parts of the cycle. Do you have students who get stuck in the same spot? Often what we see in time with our students is the process of them bumping into themselves and this is where we can help. Over the years I ask artists and creatives what makes them stuck. And their answers are usually not technique or craft related, they're human, such as competing priorities, imposter syndrome, creating faster than they can capture their ideas, procrastination, laziness. But we really have to go another step deeper with these answers. For example, procrastination. If we just label someone as a procrastinator, it's judgmental and you can't work with that. If you ask why is there inaction, the answers are often signs about capacity or people pleasing, perfectionism, overwhelm, cup overly filled, too much going on and not caring for ourselves. For teachers, this might look like being everything to everyone and for music students, it might be pressure, people pleasing and perfectionism and being vulnerable. The definition of introvert that I'm using in this presentation is a simple one and there's a lot of research on this topic and I'm taking the definition from Susan Cain's Quiet, The Power of Introverts in a World That Can't Stop Talking and her book for quiet teenagers, Quiet Power, Growing Up in a World That Can't Stop Talking. Introversion and extroversion are on a continuum and approximately 30% of people fall into the introvert end of the spectrum somewhere. In the simplest of terms, introverts get their energy from being by themselves or being quiet and extroverts receive their energy by being amongst others. In Quiet Power, whose audience is quiet teens, Susan Cain says, there's a psychological term for people like me. We're called introverts and there's no single way to define us. We enjoy the company of others, but also enjoy alone time. We can have great social skills and also be private and keep to ourselves. We are observant. We might listen more than we talk. Being an introvert is about having a deep inner life 
and considering that inner life to be important. If an introvert is someone who looks inward, an extrovert is just the opposite. Extroverts thrive in groups and gain energy from being around others. It's about energy management in a very busy world and many school students either are not aware of their own needs to even consider energy management or don't have enough autonomy to do this. This can result in overstimulation and burnout and school is a very busy world and so are families. There is a large focus on information and conversation from the outside in where introverts thrive in environments where the focus is more balanced or from the inside out. So energy management is worth bringing into this conversation. Therefore, introverts are not necessarily shy nor antisocial. They're simply not getting what they need. Time to regroup. But the body will take what the body needs. And in my case at school, I was the vague kid who simply looked out the window. I was processing, dreaming, worrying, absorbing. It looked like being vague, but in fact, there was a lot going on in my head. Fun fact, some introverts literally have thinner skin, thus absorbing outside stimulus more readily. And some introverts have pupils which dilate wider, also absorbing stimuli at a faster rate. It makes sense then that they might want to withdraw more quickly than others in order to avoid being overstimulated. Dr. Elaine Aron began researching high sensitivity in 1991 and again, to get to the kernel of things for this short presentation, she found that 20% of all cultures, including 20% of the animal kingdom, have high sensitivity. It's not a personality trait, it's just how 20% of people are neurologically wired. Think of it in the same way that a percentage of the population is left-handed. This wiring skewed towards high sensitivity is considered evolutionary. And I suppose if you think back to caveman times, this makes sense. Some people are needed to hunt food and kill threats but others are needed to sit quietly around the fire, listening out for subtle noises in the bushes, unusual smells, and things that might threaten the tribe. Generally, HSPs tend to be more philosophical or spiritual, dislike small talk, describe themselves as creative or intuitive, love music, nature, art, and beauty, experience emotions very strongly, are very empathetic, Process information about the environment, light, sound, touch, smell, taste. Feel dynamics in a room or between people. And they have rich and complex inner lives. They can be described as self-starters if left to their own devices. Some HSPs may be skewed towards particular sensitivities such as light, sound, smell, or group dynamics. Have you ever known the kid who just seems to know what's going on? Others feel great empathy towards the environment or animals or a particular group of people. It's an annoying trait, but it is a gift for me, for my compositions. I'm able to get underneath what's really happening and ask much deeper questions of myself and of my students. I can hear nuance in sound which helps my composing and I feel like I can name elephants in the room if I need to. Well, I can certainly feel and know the elephants in the room, but I may not have the words to name them, nor the courage to name them sometimes. So what can overstimulation or full capacity look like? It's a stress response. Fight, flight, freeze or fawn. People pleasing, snappiness, hangry, losing words, being vague. The body knows what it needs. A student might be wired, lethargic or sometimes shut down. The inner ear exercise is a simple exercise that provides inner creativity and is an inside out activity. I'd like to do a short exercise together and I'm going to ask you to sit and listen to your internal musical voice. 
This is a great one to do to tune up the inner ear, to give your students a break from any external stimulation, and it expands the imagination. You don't need anything for this exercise, just shut your eyes if you can. Think of a simple tune you already know. It might be happy birthday, row row your boat, something simple that you know really well. Once you've got your tune, listen through to it in your head without making any audible noise. I'll give you a moment to do that now. As you're listening to the music, I'd like you to notice the following things. What volume did you play it through to yourself? What kind of tempo did it have? What vibe? Was it sing-songy, melancholy? Was there an inadvertent intention? We're gonna play around with this tune a little and add some different interpretations. So the first one's quite simple. I'd like you to play the tune through in your head with the instrumentation of bassoon. This time, change your instrument to double bass. Is it bowed or pits? This time, the choice of instrumentation is yours, but I'd like you to take it at a much faster tempo. What are the things that you're noticing? Acknowledge these. Perhaps the different instrumentation or different tempos or volumes creates a different character or vibe. Let's go again and this time change the harmony or mode. For example, if it's in a major flavor, maybe change it to a minor or a tonal mode. Totally your choice. And this time I'd also like you to add in a lot of space so it's quite dramatic. It might create a more melancholy version of your tune or maybe it's more humorous because it's so dramatic. This time I'd like you to build the tension across the structure of your tune. Imagine somebody standing on stage, maybe an opera singer or a trumpet player, and they're starting really quietly and building to a terrific tension towards the end. Reflect back on your arrangement of this last iteration. What was it that you adjusted to your melody to build the tension? You can be thinking about volume, dynamics, tempo, characterization, articulation. What instrument did it appear in? And for the final one, I'd like to use your imagination and create a version of your tune for solo suspended cymbal. This exercise helps students who may come into your class a little overstimulated or with a lack of capacity, and it builds both space for capacity and it allows for a little rejuvenation through creativity. It's always a reminder to me about how creative humans are and allowing the imagination to soar, even in a small way like this, without having to bother about notating and transcribing and describing. So what's happening for students when they're bumping into themselves? The signposts can be negative self-talk, comparison, capacity, too much stimuli, priorities, the inner critic, perfectionism, people pleasing, big feelings, or just deeply processing their day. So how can we help students create capacity in our classrooms? I think one of the most beautiful things that we can offer is acknowledgement. Acknowledgement that life is messy Acknowledgement and feeling seen in the room goes a long way to building capacity. And the reason I say that is that I think many students who are on the 
introvert end of the introversion extroversion spectrum and who have high sensitivity may not yet understand that about themselves they simply might just feel different or feel overwhelmed but because that feeling is so familiar to them they may not notice that this is different for other people so to be acknowledged and to hear language from the teacher or from other adults that capacity is an issue might help them understand where they themselves sit uh, with their bucket of capacity. Acknowledging the elephants in the room is also really important. The elephants don't need to be dealt with, but I always think it's rather nice for them to be acknowledged. People feel and know the elephants in the room People know when there is a can of worms sitting there and when it's acknowledged, people can feel relieved that everything in the positive and the negative space of the classroom is being realised and, and it creates a feeling of safety uh, for the student. Acknowledge stairwell students. For example, ask in the following lesson whether anyone's had any further thoughts about what was discussed last lesson or perhaps invite students to send you an email during the week doesn't mean you have to reply but to hear from a student who may prefer to quietly send you an email rather than to speak up in class might be nice introverts and hsps often wait to be invited because they don't want to be seen or felt as an intrusion on anyone's time Acknowledge emotions and feelings as important signposts that tell us something about ourselves as opposed to things that just need to be dealt with in the body and encourage students to note them at least to themselves. Discuss the creative process and where excitement and zing might lie but also resistance and hesitation. Acknowledge Acknowledge the creative process allows us to bump into ourselves and learn about ourselves. Shaking is a really great way to quiet the autonomic nervous system. So if you have students who have had a really busy day and come in a little bit wired, shaking their bodies is a way where the nervous system can understand to relieve stress. Create a playlist of music for gaining capacity for your class. Ask them to contribute to it. Use it whenever you need to. Ask students what music or art form creates capacity for them and why. Dig in a little bit. And listen to music in the classroom without a, rate, without a reason, just for the sake of it. No analysis, no context, just listening. You could create alternatives where you can. Group work, for example, is really wonderful and HSPs and introverts do need to do it. But what would happen if they were left to their own devices sometime? Many quieter students are able to thrive and create and dream very big and outside of the box if there's a little bit of space and flexibility in which to do so. Is this a possibility in your classroom? Every year I out myself at some point during the university year as an introvert. And I always laugh because once I've done this, I usually come back to my office and at some point in the next 24 hours receive an email or two from a student who says, oh, I never would have thought that you were an introvert. I'm one too. And then they tell me their story. And I think it's just nice to have that connection with a student where they feel that their teacher understands. And finally, use techniques such as creating space for palate cleansers, listening to music, listening to silence, guided listening, imagining, breathing. Books such as The Body Keeps the Score or Burnout and How to Complete the Cycle of Stress are really important in helping us understand the role of the body in creativity. I look forward to connecting with you throughout this conference and if there's any way that I can be of assistance or service, please sing out. Thank you.